everybody, welcome to the inaugural FPMRS soon to be Euroguide journal Instagram live. Uh, I'm Kate Merriweather. I'm one of the assistant editors uh, for the editorial board of the soon to be Eurogyne Ecology journal, um, the AUG's official journal. And joining me tonight, my guest requires no introduction, <laughs> uh, Dr. Linda Brubaker. Our, our inaugural guest and uh, interviewee to help us with the discussion tonight. Um, Dr. Brubaker, many of you know, uh, is uh, one of the greats in, in our field of FPMRS, soon to be urogynecology. Um, she's a professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences at uh, UC San Diego. Prior to that, many of you know, she served uh, for quite a while as the Dean of the Loyola University Chicago Stritch School of Medicine. Um, she's been past president past program chair, et cetera, of both the Eurogynecologic Society, so AUGS, as well as the Society of Gynecologic Surgeons. So her name is on all those wonderful president profile <laughs> boards um, as one of the only female surgeons, and we're all very proud of that. Um, she's absolutely a pillar of research in our community. Um, she's been the PI or a co-PI in very many NIH awards um, and is the consortium chair for the NIGDK Plus Research Consortium. Um, her current research interests, for those of you who, who don't follow her work, um, is in the human neurobiome, recurrent UTI and bladder health. Um, I can't list all her awards and accomplishments tonight because it would take up our whole life. Um, but needless to say, we're very honored to talk to her a day about the, the turns and the twists that have gone into this, this field that we call FPMRS, soon to be Eurogynecology. Um, she's currently the editor in chief of the, of the journal uh, for AUGS. Um, and it was formerly called the Journal of Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery. And this live is gonna be talking about a little uh, facelift title change that we're looking forward to in the coming months. Uh, no one better than uh, Linda to discuss it with us today. Um, so I'm gonna, with that, sort of kick it off um, by turning it over to Linda and saying, um, Linda, tell us a little bit about how you first got into this field, you know, so what attracted you to the field of urogynecology and um, what, what does this profession mean to you? Okay, first, thank you for number one, organizing this and so Stephanie for helping us make it happen, operationalizing it and, and helping us manage chat questions and everything else. Um, I can tell you for sure that when I moved into this field, when we started the journal, when I took over as editor in chief of the journal, we didn't have Instagram. And so one of the things, just like in our patient care, just like in research, new things happen, it's important to keep up, and we can do better by our patients, we can do better by each other, by learning new things and making advances. And I've seen, um, I'm happy to say, a lot of advances in our field. And I'm just so excited when I see the human potential at meetings, um, the membership of AUGS, and the number of people who are really committing their professional lives to caring for women with pelvic floor disorders. We have so much to help them with. Amen to that. If you can reflect back, how did that first become apparent to you back when you were starting out in medicine? Yeah, well, when I was a medical student, resident, there really wasn't a subspecialty of urogynecology. It was kind of a hobby interest of certain people. Um, there were some societies, the Society of Gynecology Surgeons, for example, is called the Society of Vaginal Surgeons or Vaginal Surgeon Society. Um, and it was just um, kind of a special interest area. But when you begin to look at the demographics of uh, women who are affected with pelvic floor disorders and the tremendous need for research and scientific advancement in our field, it was really clear that it didn't make sense for this just to be a hobby. And those of us who began to provide care for patients realized the need to train many, many more people. It sh you shouldn't have to cross state lines to get treatment for your pelvic floor disorders. You should find someone fairly close to your own community who's competent and well-trained and able to do a variety of treatment options according to a patient's preference. And we could see in the beginning that that just wasn't possible unless we began to establish a subspecialty, formalize it, get it recognized, get high quality training programs going and build the infrastructure for research, education, scientific advancement, and a society that could help support each other as we grew up professionally together. That's fantastic. And of course, again, reflecting back, 
back when you were first sort of in this, what was maybe then a hobby or a niche, um, do you remember what the scope of practice was? What were some of the disorders that urogynecologists or people that had, a, had an interest in pelvic floor disorders treated back then? Yeah, the, the scope was really kind of the bread and butter of what urogynecology is today, um, bladder control, prolapse, a little bit of bowel control, um, but there wasn't a whole lot of advanced care for fistulas or diverticula um, or you know, advanced reconstructive surgery. That was um, not well developed in most centers, but the early training programs did focus on surgical and non-surgical approaches for stress incontinence, non-surgical management for um, urgency incontinence, mixed incontinence, and a variety of treatments for prolapse almost all vaginal when I began um, treatment. Sacral copalpexy was, was really not being done very much at all. And for those of you that are listening at home that are maybe not in our field, sacral copalpexy is a surgery in which we, which we put artificial synthetic mesh on the front and the back of the vagina, attach that to the tailbone in order to support vaginas that are experiencing prolapse. Um, Linda, when you became a urogynecologist or developed and interested, what did the field look like? What kind of folks did you meet going around AUGS in its early days, for example? Yeah, people who were very welcoming and very excited to hear that there were other people who shared their interest and people who could begin to collaborate. There was very little NIH research funding in the beginning. Um, so those of us who knew that that was gonna be uh, essential for our specialty to grow up professionally and be on par, with the other established subspecialties in ob knew that that was gonna be an important uh, aspect of our work. And so we had to set up to um, visit the Hill in Washington and meet with lawmakers and make sure that we got our share of NIH funding. And um, one of our former AUGS presidents, Rick Bump, really sealed the deal one day when he just simply took a picture of vault prolapse with us. And he showed it to these lawmakers whose eyes were just you know, wide, wide open, like, oh my goodness, we didn't know that that could even happen. It's, it's that old phrase of pictures of worth a thousand words. So um, people like Peggy Norton, Rick Bum, John Delancey helped with those early visits just to help even get our specialty known, get the disorders that our patients suffered on people's radar, that this wasn't a secret shame that people should have. This was a real physical problem and we have treatment for it. We just needed more doctors trained in this area. Absolutely. I had never heard the tale of the, the vagina Polaroid that went to Capitol Hill. That's really fascinating. Yes, it was um, a brilliant idea on Rick's part. Mm -hmm. Very, very brilliant. Uh, as you think about your colleagues that you meet every day today, what looks different? What looks the same? What looks the same is the dedication to helping patients with these sometimes embarrassing disorders and beginning to normalize that if this happens, you go see a urogynecologist and you get treatment for it. And to begin to normalize the conversation of like, oh, my friend went, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna start early and I'm not gonna wait till this ruins 20 years of my life or separates me from my intimate life or anything else like that, that we can help bring this out of the closet, help make sure that we have effective treatments that are acceptable to patients in an affordable way and again, hopefully they don't have to cross state lines. They should find a well-trained, capable, patient-friendly urogynecologist fairly close to them. And back when this was more of a hobby or a niche in obstetrics and gynecology or maybe urology, what made the switch? What went from people looking around and saying, gosh, this really should be specific training and, and should have more science and expertise to it being a recognized field as opposed to a niche or a hobby? That's such a great question. And I wish we could all just, you know, have the cocktail of your choice and sit and talk about this because it's a very, very interesting story. And I hope this history doesn't get lost. But um, truthfully, there was just more and more problems that trained physicians were seeing with the care of patients who were treated by people who didn't know better and they weren't given good treatments. Um, sometimes they were rushed to surgery for the wrong thing. And we could see the harm that was coming to women. Um, and it wasn't because somebody was setting out to harm them, they were trying to help, 
but they just didn't know how to help. They didn't know any evidence for what best treatments were. Basic things like not being able to, we used to spend hours teaching the difference between stress and urge incontinence. And I know that still is a, a thing that is taught, but more so now at the resident level and the medical student level. But this was still a major thing, like don't take somebody to surgery because they urinate too frequently, those kind of basic tenants. Um, and when we saw the harm that was coming to people from poorly performed procedures, um, inappropriately per performed uh, procedures, um, inappropriate, you know, five, four or five years of medication for stress incontinence and there was no medication for stress incontinence, this kind of thing. And we just began to feel like we had a moral obligation to help elevate the care for this group of patients who were really sort of falling through the cracks. And, and we all sort of agreed on that. So that wasn't a problem. And then it was just going through the steps of getting the, um, getting all the ducks in the row, working with the American Board of ob and the American Board of Urology, who had to uh, find a way to join those who are from either background to join a single specialty dedicated to helping women with pelvic floor disorders and making sure that that specialty could be recognized by other boards since there's a very long process. And a lot of people helped with this. Um, many of these people have um, passed on now, but their memory still lives within our specialty. And um, the early efforts that these individuals made um, will never be forgotten, certainly by me. Wide, wide applause for myself and all the folks watching this video for, for all that, that you did and they did and that legacy that lives on. Uh, do you remember there being much opposition at that time? And what was the major opposition or what were the protestations that you heard? You know, there's a lot of fear of the unknown. Um, and this is true anytime you try to solve a problem. If you come at the problem with um, a scarcity mentality, there's only two people in the United States that need at that time a birch urethropexy. If there's only two of them and you get one and I get one, then there's none for anybody else. And why don't I get two and you get zero? That would even be better. So people were initially thinking, oh, there's just not enough to go around. We really have to fight over this. And you know, your specialty can't have more than my specialty or your area. But very, very quickly, people realized, oh, there's plenty. <laughs> this is a very, very common disorder. And this is really an all hands on deck situation. So as with many historical cases in medicine, there are little bits of turf battles. There are still areas within uh, the United States where there are still ongoing little bits of turf battles. Um, it's hard to imagine that um, it was a problem for a urogynecologist to do a cystoscopy for safety after surgery. That was an issue, and there were some hospital staffs that wouldn't allow that. But with time, once the safety profile of that procedure was recognized, um, and there was a real clear delineation that urogynecologists weren't going to be doing cystos to do bladder cancer surveillance, that there was a very natural demarcation of how this procedure would be used by different uh, individuals, um, most of that fell away. And our uh, ability to collaborate effectively across specialties really blossomed. Um, and, and we've just got wonderful colleagues um, across the, the country who have been helpful in helping make sure that that initially fragile relationship has stayed strong. Fantastic. And, you know, I recall because you were in the room when I took my oral boards for uh, FPMRS at the time, one of the inaugural classes that took oral tests to become a member of this, of this now exclusive subspecialty. Um, at that time, you were the director for the subspecialty division um, for ABOG. Tell us about that time period in which it was being developed as its own recognized, ABOG recognized subspecialty in which people would get boarded and certified in it. Yeah, Dee Fenner was the director of the subspecialty group at that time for ABOG, and she was masterful in um, having the conversations uh, publicly and importantly, the private conversations that were needed to help move this forward so that when it came time for the other boards to approve the establishment of this as a unique subspecialty with support by both the American Board of Urology and the American Board of OB-GYN, that the vote was the votes were going to be there and uh, you never know for sure until you're there but um, she was really masterful in um, guiding that to a, a successful conclusion and i i think i 
our society knows how much she contributed to um, that important milestone in our subspecialty. Absolutely. A lot of scientific work went into it, but also, as you alluded to, a lot of political work of getting the science and the data and the, the need in front of folks. Yeah. Uh, when the name FPMRS, Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery, came up as an option, why was it chosen as sort of the new name of the field back in the 2000s when this was going on? Yeah, so we're all kind of finding our way as best we could. It's our urology collaborators, the gynecology collaborators, each coming from our own background. And there were many more individuals being trained with a gynecology background than a urology background. So for many of us, it seemed that urogynecology should be in the name, but our urology colleagues were hesitant about that um, because they were trained from a urology background. And so this was, without a doubt, a bit of a clunky name that uh, was sort of negotiated just to like get us started. And um, female pelvic medicine was to help recognize that not everybody needs surgery, but also the reconstructive surgery part to recognize that this is a surgical discipline. And so that's how it got started. And um, it was good enough to get us started. But I think you all know that everybody just still calls us urogynecology. And so there's, there's our formal name and then our really, really well-known nickname that uh, everybody goes by. Right, urogynecology to our friends, right? Urogynecology to our friends, absolutely. No, 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 FPMRS is my father. No. <laughs> uh, well, one, a little editorializing, one of the things I liked about it, because FPMRS was, was the name when I entered the field. So that's kind of all I've known since I've been a physician in this space, um, is that I liked that it alluded to the fact that we are a mixed methods profession, right? There is an element of medicine, and then there's also this element of surgery. Um, do you think that capturing that going forward is really important to the public eye or to folks' opinion? What are your thoughts there? It's be interesting because all of us who are board, subspecialty boarded are boarded in FPMRS. There's no one boarded in neurogynecology. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that works. Um, in my own experience, both in Chicago at Loyola and now in San Diego at UCSD, people really just refer to everybody as urogynecologists. And um, so I think there's a, a great advance in other specialties and primary care physicians, other clinicians recognizing what urogynecologists do. And, and different uh, practices have higher doses or lower doses of non-surgical practice. Um, and that's totally fine. The local people understand kind of what you do. Um, and since most people don't want to refer to somebody who op operates on everybody all the time, that's usually kind of a red flag. But you can have a busy surgical practice, certainly within urogynecology, and, and have colleagues who handle non-surgical or nurse practitioners who help with some of the non-surgical stuff. And, and that's also good. We now have wonderful um, colleagues, uh, non-physician colleagues, nurse practitioners, physical therapists who I've been blessed to work with my entire career. And, and that cohort of allied uh, assistants, allied professionals, has made a huge difference in the care of patients and our ability to provide more care more efficiently with higher rates of patient satisfaction. I agree. I, I was looking around my division, meaning like my sub branch of my department the other day, and realizing that it has nothing to do with the degree you have anymore. Your division now is this wonderful mix, this alphabet soup of people of different degrees and backgrounds and skill sets and people that do things I will never learn about or, or, uh, or be able to do myself. So it's so wonderful. Um, how do you think the training, Linda, has evolved with that? As we go through that shift of, okay, being a urogynecologist means this or means that. How has the training evolved? So think about your training, think about maybe my training, think about the training of someone who's going to start becoming a urogynecologist in the next few years. I think the training has evolved, it must evolve. And I still think we have some work to do in those areas because um, there's kind of a lineage in certain programs. As some programs are, oh, this is a vaginal surgery program, this is an abdominal surgery program. And when you graduate from those programs, you may not feel as strong 
in those other areas. Some places do all their sacred copal plexus robotically, others are straight stick. And, and I think it's healthier if we get a little more diversity that, that can be difficult from a pragmatic standpoint. Um, but I do think that's something that we need to kind of work on so that people feel comfortable. But that being said, I also have faith that um, the people who graduate now can be surgically adept and can learn new skills. Think how terrible it would be if you only knew what you learned during fellowship. You never learned a new procedure. You never learned any new technical anything. That would really be a problem if you're practicing 20, 30 or more years. So I think it's incumbent on all of us to continue our training beyond the formal time of fellowship. Absolutely. And you never know what you could learn. You know, Linda and I are on Instagram live right now. So anything, anything can be acquired as a, as a Absolutely. Skill. And rumor has it, it keeps our brain young. So who knows? Yeah. <laughs> it's good. So let's, you know, fast forward to 2021. How did the conversation start to maybe change the name of the field or the journal, et cetera, back to urogynecology? Who brought that up? Who was in the room? Yeah, well, there's, um, I was not in the room, but I'm aware that there's been a conversation going on really since, since the name was originally established. And there are colleagues, I have some very, um, I respect a great deal of colleagues who just say, no, I really think we should keep FPMRS. But the vast majority of individuals that I've spoken with that I hear from um, prefer just to have what we're actually called uh, urogynecology. And this is something that the um, American Board of OB-GYN um, is working carefully with. Um, Matt Barber is uh, the director of the subspecialty division now, and he is working closely um, with the leadership of the board to have those public and private conversations to move this forward. Um, and it requires several approvals and you know, unless you, you know, feel free to talk to Matt or any of the other sub, uh, people who are on the subspecialty board, but um, it's, it's a really very important conversation that I do believe will end up with us having an official name change to what we're called in our everyday life, urogynecology. How do you think this appears to patients? Do you think, I've never met a patient that used the FPMRS name or, or goodness forbid, said it all out loud. Um, I've only heard a patient refer to me as a urogynecologist or other OBGYN colleagues, but do you think it changes the way patients perceive us? I don't. I think it actually is going to be more approachable uh, for patients because FPRMRS agreed. I've never had anybody say that, right? Um, and I mean, if you just look on, look on Instagram, you know, search for FPRMRS, you come up with journals and things, but you don't find it in patient conversations. Same thing with Twitter. You, patients are saying, you know, we need a urogynecologist or whatever, but they, they don't say find FPRMRS. So that seems kind of the standoffish formal title and patients want to know us better. So they're looking for urogynecologists. That being said, there are still far too many people who don't actually know what a urogynecologist is or does. And there are far too many physicians and other clinicians who don't exactly know what a urogynecologist is. Um, you can just, you could find, um, you know, you're sitting next to somebody in the pedicure salon or talking to somebody in the grocery line or whatever, and they ask, you know, what do you do? Most of you, if you say you got, a, you're, I'm a urogynecologist, you know, there's going to be a follow up question. But if you just say I'm a doctor, like, oh, that's cool. They get that. That I'm a urogynecologist requires further discussion. So you choose your answer based on how long you want to stay in that conversation, right? It's great at dinner parties, right? Like, what do you do? I'm a urogynecologist. Well, tell me all about that. And it kind of is like everyone puts down their fork and yeah. starts looking at you. And by the yeah. end, at the end of the sentence about incontinence and prolapse, and yeah. you know, you've used the word vagina three times in a yeah. minute. Everyone, everyone is staring at you by the end yeah. of the conversation. No question. Absolutely. And then if it's a cocktail hour, there's a few people who are like, "Well, can I talk to you privately over here for just a minute?" I have a friend who, I mean, and that's that is. Everybody gets that. Um, so it's an important thing that we do. And, um, but we really need to just make sure that women have their urogynecologists on speed dial. They should know what a urogynecologist is, what we do, how we can help them, um, and when they should be seeing someone. Mm -hmm. 
what do you think is the biggest misalignment other than just not knowing who we are or what we are? What's the sort of bis biggest misalignment between what we think we are and what we do and what patients think we are and what we do? Yeah, I'd say that is um, patients think that uh, if they come to see a urologist, they're gonna have to have surgery. And so they may delay coming in for care because they don't want to have surgery. And of course, no ethical urologist is going to force any patient to have surgery against their will. We, 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 we're blessed in our, surgery, in our field that we don't have those kind of problems, right? There's, it's, it's, you know, emergency surgery, emergency prolapse probably exists somewhere, but it's a pretty rare animal. So by and large, uh, you know, unless you have an evisceration, emergency surgery is just not a common thing in our lives. So um, I think it's really, really important to set a bar where people can come in and have a comfortable conversation with you. If surgery is an appropriate option, you talk with them about those surgical options, but they should never feel pressured um, to go ahead and have surgery. And certainly not like this week or next week. You know, I, that's always a red herring. Well, the doctor said I had to do it right away. You know, oh my goodness, really? Absolutely. And that also alludes a little bit to my follow up question, which is, what do you think is the biggest misalignment between who we think we are and who other doctors or people that are medical think we are? That's a harder question. Yeah, um, I think we probably need um, a little alignment with some of our other colleagues, because there's a bunch of things that sort of fall through the cracks. Most urogynecologists want to have busy surgical practices. To, to see enough patients, you have to, to, to have a full surgical practice a couple days a week in the OR. You know, you have to have been in the right place, you have to have right feeder systems, but you've got to have somebody to take care of the non-surgical work that goes with that. Um, so if you just operate and leave them with the urgent continence untreated, the recurrent UTI untreated, you're not going to get a very good reputation in that uh, field, in that, you know, neighborhood, in that community. So I think there is some alignment that we need to do with our colleagues that our team, not necessarily you personally, our team will make sure that these issues get taken care of and that we're responsive to things beyond just surgery. Absolutely. And that, that important piece we talked about earlier where there's more people in the room with us than there used to be. It used to just yes. be sort of us, us surgeons sort of trying to juggle all these different medical things, surgical things, post-operative care, medical care, trying to be in some ways, PCPs at the same time when we were OBGYNs. And now having that army of physical therapists and mid-levels and, and all the other folks that support us is, has been just game-changing for, for the women that we take care of. Absolutely. Do you think there's anything that we should do to kind of further advance our brand? Well, I do think um, we've made good progress over the last couple decades of generating higher quality of evidence to guide our practice that we cannot back off on. And I realize that it's, uh, you know, tedious and it takes discipline and training to do high quality research. But if we don't continue to contribute high quality research to inform our evidence based practice, we will begin to fall behind. And so it's really, really essential for us to be thinking about what are the high impact research questions that we need to get answered? What are the top priorities? Not just dabble around the edges at the little simple stuff. We have to really get in there, work together, and get that high impact stuff dealt with and um, use evidence in our practice. Uh, really, really try to use the evidence as best as we can. Um, I don't think, if we don't do that, our specialty will fall behind without a doubt. Absolutely. And that evidence, you know, for those of you who are listening, it's not just in, is this surgery better or that surgery better? But sometimes it's going all the way back to that first talking to the patient encounter. Is like, how do we even ask questions of women to see what's going on and how they're bothered? And how do we even do that in a good and caring and consistent way? Um, what, when, and who do we operate on? Um, you know, Linda alluded to that earlier. So there's so much to be done. And, you know, Linda's done a lot of it. <laughs> but she's, well, you know, she's really our, calling our, for you. The, the group that we're working with now through the NIDDK Plus Consortium is really kind of starting at the other end a little bit to look at what's bladder health so that we can figure out what are those risk and protective factors so that people who have good bladder health can plan on keeping it and we know there are certain risky times, such as having a vaginal delivery, 
And are there modifiable things that we can do where you can still have your family and still have a vaginal delivery? And so if we can understand bladder health, we can make some better um, advances in preventing slippage into having urinary incontinence symptoms or other lower urinary tract symptoms. So I think that's, that's a, coming up on the next decade. We'll see some good progress on that. Yeah. Absolutely. And what excites me, it's probably as true for you too, Linda, is when I'm talking to folks in scientific platforms, very frequently they say, I will bet you in 10 years that this field is going to have a completely different toolkit than it has now. So maybe mesh won't be around anymore. Maybe, you know, electrical stimulation will have taken over. What do you sort of see as being the next 10 years? What are some technologies that you see sort of becoming our next frontier that you and I are going to have to dust off our, you know, <laughs> our uh, accumulated cobwebs and like learn whole new things to, to pivot? Well, um, I know I have a bias in this area because I have done work in the urinary microbiome over the last decade. But I do think there's promise in that science if we can work out some of the technical aspects um, so that we can make this an effective tool for us clinically. If you're sitting with a patient and you're getting ready to start her on a medication for bladder control, instead of just quoting a population average, oh, you got a 50% or 60% chance that this will help you, we could take some measures for her and say, you know, this medicine's unlikely to help you, or actually you have a very high chance of responding to this medicine. And we may be able to modulate her uro urobiome to enhance her ability to respond or maintain a response to that medicine. Um, you know, we know our patients don't particularly like those daytime everyday medicines. Many of them don't continue. And uh, most of them don't get the kind of symptom relief that we would like to see for them. So, so helping with that, I think, could really make a difference for bladder control. So I, I think over the next 10 years, I would be um, really, really happy to see if we could make some important breakthroughs in that area. I would love that, too. I would, lo I would love to be able to tell my patients not only maybe why you have the issues you do, um, but why you would respond better to this than that, um, because I think a lot of patients are hungry for that kind of information. I agree. As you've been the editor in chief of the journal, how do you think the journal has sort of contributed to these mental shifts of who we are, what we do, the science that we have behind us? Well, there's just so much exciting stuff going on with our journal. And Kate, thank you for your contributions as an assistant editor. It, we'd really appreciate having you as a member of our editorial team. So we, uh, as you know, are um, changing over to an uh, electronic journal. E-migration starts January, uh, July 1st with the name change to Urogynecology. And our goal is to be the gold standard in Urogynecology publishing. So we want the highest quality of publications that are relevant to our field, that aren't incremental changes, that really are impactful. Uh, we'll have new um, parts of our journal that say, why does this matter? And we'll also have lay summaries so that consumers can pick up the research we're doing and have more informed conversations with their clinicians as well. So the journal plays an important role in making sure that the evidence is high quality, bringing forth um, quality manuscripts that are prepared in readable, digestible formats. And because we finally caught up on our backlog and we have a quick time to first decision, we'll now have a quick time to publication as well. We're there now, our backlog is is solved. So encourage your publications now, bring your best stuff to us. And once we have that, we can also begin to have commentaries by experts in the field, looking at different points of view, and looking at some of the controversies in our field, um, as we all try to find a way forward together. And, you know, and I just thank you for your contributions and the editorial board. This journal is so forward thinking. And the fact that we're even on an Instagram live right now talking from the viewpoint of an editorial board member on a journal, uh, that we're on this platform having these conversations live and not just relying on that paper page to, to get folks the evidence about our field that we need. So great. So, so thanks for well, joining. I, I hope everybody who joined is following the Augs Instagram account. We don't have a separate uh, um, journal account yet, but um, you can follow me as the editor. Um, on Twitter and um, follow, of course, the Augs office and the journal. 
on Twitter. So um, we try to make sure that everybody gets the information the way they want. Some people do it through social media um, and nobody's going to be getting a hard copy to read anymore. So we're, we're modernizing the journal in look, in function, in format as well. I'm going to have less things to hold my doors open. <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, while I'm, I'm going to call Stephanie back for a minute. Um, hi, Stephanie. Um, and Hello. Stephanie, well, while we were talking, did you see any um, chat questions? Or does anyone want to start throwing out some chat questions from our watching audience? So I do see a hi, Dr. Merriweather, in the chat. Hi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, another hi, Kate. So you got some fans out there. Yeah, um, yeah. But right now, um, no questions yet, but um, please feel free to ask any questions or offer any comments um, from tonight's talk. Well, while we're waiting for one to come in, Kate, maybe I'll tell a story or two. You've asked me about oh, how things have changed. And I think I mentioned to you as we were putting our heads together, um, thinking about this uh, live event, when I first went to AUGS and first went to SGS, the lines for the women's rooms were very short. There were only two or three or four of us that would go to those places. So that was kind of nice, <laughs> um, but it's really, really nice to see um, so many more women in the field and uh, that everybody is pitching in um, to make this work. Um, when I started my surgical career, there were two changing areas, one for the doctors and one for the nurses. And it wasn't exactly clear where I should change, right? So. Um, so a lot has changed for the better, and um, I, I'm just so, so thankful for that. If, and if this much can change uh, in the years that I've seen, I'm so optimistic for our specialty and the people who are joining our specialty. Um, if we just support each other, help each other, and really maintain the honor and the rigor of our subspecialty, um, the world is our oyster, and our patients will do very, very well. Absolutely, and and I'm so happy that you know, I got to enter the field at a time when there had been so many powerful women that came before me that, that were wonderful surgeons and wonderful scientists that sort of paved the way. I know that, you know, men entering this field have their own sort of battles to fight because it's a tricky profession to be in if you're yes. a male. Sometimes yes. patients have a different sort of relationship with you. Um, but being a female surgeon, you got to have folks that you can look up to and that can mentor you. And that's so critical when you're, when you're a woman in this profession. So and, and all the surgical skills I learned were taught to me by really wonderful men. So I'm so grateful to them. Absolutely. Well, we have a chat question. It's actually a cool clinical question, which I have spent some time thinking about lately as someone asked, was there any ideas on cyclosporine A, that's a, a medication, interestingly, like a chemotherapy kind of medication for treating OABIC, the, um, for those of you watching, that's overactive bladder interstitial cystitis, when at the end of the treatment line, so tried everything else. Linda, do you have any thoughts or want to weigh in on this one? Yeah, a couple things. First of yep. all, I'm um, a bit of a, a stickler for worded word things, and that's probably why I'm in this editor job. So I don't really see OAB and IC as overlapping. I, I really see them as two separate entities, and they may have some common symptoms, but I feel like they're, they're different. And so I think we're going to focus then on the severe pain. And I think once the pain is like severe and refractory and you know, I, I have known and, and um, been around patients who've ended their life because of uncontrolled bladder pain. So it's something I take very seriously. We know chronic narcotics are not the right way to do it, but there are things like dorsal column stimulators and advanced neural techniques. One of the things I think we don't do is we don't graduate these patients over to pain specialists. We keep focusing on bladder, 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 bladder. Mm -hmm. And that pain signal has long left the bladder. It's all mapped through the central nervous system. And if we are just focusing on bladder, that signal that's elsewhere in the central nervous system is not getting attended to. And so I think it's uh, harmful to those patients to only focus on bladder-based therapies. Um, and of course, we don't know really exactly what interstitial cystitis is. We talk about it, we give our long lectures, but you know, in the quiet of our hearts, it's a pain disorder that we really don't understand. It's neither interstitial or inflammatory, so it's poorly named, and diagnostic criteria are pretty iffy except for bladder ulcer. So we just have to be very open 
about what we don't know about that condition. Overactive bladder, though, I think is a symptom that has a lot of very discrete underlying causes. And I'm hoping that microbiome science can help move us along a little bit there. It's not all just about anticholinergic and beta-3 agonists. Um, there's a much bigger story there, so yeah. Absolutely. And, and for those of you who might have just joined us, uh, you know, interstitial cystitis uh, bladder pain syndrome is one of this, those disorders that before urogynecology was really a field and a recognized one, it fell hopelessly through the cracks all the time because gynecologists really didn't feel like it, they owned it and urologists really didn't feel like they owned it and it affects disproportionately women. So that's a great example of what we were talking about earlier as once our field got an identity and a niche and started advancing the science, suddenly interstitial cystitis, bladder pain syndrome patients had a home that they never had before. So just wanted to call back to that earlier point. Yeah. Um, there's a question in the chat saying, is the FTMRS journal changing its name and why? Well, yes, and it is. Yes, <laughs> we are. July 1st, you'll see behind me our former cover with a new gold colors. Uh, FTMRS will be called Urogynecology. And it's because what most people call us. And uh, so we just thought we would be ahead of the time. Luckily, this um, journal change won't, we don't have to start all over with our impact factor. Our impact factors are relatively low compared to something like the New England Journal or JAMA. You know, we're in the ones and twos and threes. Those places are in the 70s and 100s. Um, so people don't publish in this journal or other competing urogynecology journals because of the impact factor. Um, so we'll have a little um, wiggle with our impact factor for a year or two as we get to be the top journal in urogynecology. We're really looking forward to, to nailing that. Absolutely, and th those of you that are, are maybe not as aware, um, formerly FPMRS, now going to be Journal Urogynecology, is actually the official journal of the American Urogynecologic Association, um, Society, sorry, AUGS. So because AUGS has urogynecology in the name, it's very fitting that now we're kind of bringing it all together. So urogynecology is our identity. So and we also have three international affiliated societies and outside the United States, FPRMS is not nomenclature that's used. People use the word urogynecology globally. Absolutely. Yep, it's, it's kind of part of our brand, if you were. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I know, um, that we have a few people that are watching that are patients. I know we have a few people watching that are other physicians. Thank you for joining us. And we have a few people watching um, that are just inst uh, interested Instagrammers that uh, recognize Linda or myself and popped on. Um, do any of you have any questions? Um, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I know Savannah V23 has another question about sort of tethered cord syndrome and pain because Linda and I love talking about pain. Um, and I would be happy to answer that for you, Savannah, some other time. You have my number, so feel free to, yeah. you know, yeah. get in and, touch and, with me. I would, I would love to talk to you more about that. Yeah. And I'll even pick Linda's brain for you if you want. Well, just to say tethered cord, something everybody should know how to pick up and treat. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Very dangerous stuff. Actually. Very dangerous stuff. Yep. Um, there's another question in the chat that says, do you see non-invasive treatments for SUI or mixed urinary incontinence, UI, impacting the options of urogyne servants to offer patients and, and to what degree? Um, Linda, why don't you take that one first? I'll chime in if, if you want. Yeah, I, I think that's always been on the table. I, I don't think that there's been a big change in, in that. Um, I think offering non-surgical um, is always fine. The worst that happens is they don't get better. And if that's their preference, they waited. Um, it just makes good sense. If you push somebody into surgery and their surgery doesn't work, as a certain number of surgeries don't work, they're going to feel like, oh, I shouldn't have had that surgery. I should have tried that other thing first. Whereas if they try that other thing first, and that wasn't helpful, and then they go to surgery, and unfortunately, the surgery is not helpful. At least they feel like they went in a logical path. They're a little bit more prepared. Still disappointing, of course, but a little bit more prepared. And, um, you know, do you guys want surgery? Generally, no. So most people, like, would rather have surgery on other people. So we just have to be conscious of our patients' preferences, too. Yep. The analogy I'll often use with my patients is that if there was a restaurant around the corner from you that opened up and you didn't know if it was good or not, 
you would probably go there at least once because you say, yeah, if I like it, it's right around the corner. I'm going to go there all the time. If you go there and it's not so good, you'll say, ah, no problem. I'll get in my car and drive to the further away restaurant that I know is good. That's okay. But you're going to try it, right? So it's, it's, there's very little harm in the, using the convenient non-invasive options. And I think that us as urogynecologists, pardon me, <coughs> it doesn't compromise our identity or our brand at all to offer non-invasive options because I think we fancy ourselves very much, as I talked about earlier, this mixed methods profession where surgery is part of our toolkit, but non-surgery is also very much a part of our toolkit. And we wouldn't be really worthy of calling ourselves urogynecologists if we didn't know both sides of the surgery, non-surgery treatment option agreed, coin. Agreed, agreed. Questions. Well, those are really good questions. I don't know if we missed any from anybody. I'm just going to scroll back through. But if anybody thinks of any others, you're, of course, welcome to either uh, Instagram message me or you can tweet at me at Kate Merriweather one. Um, Linda also has Instagram and, and Twitter um, and has been very important in getting some of some of us in the field into sort of the modern era by by getting on social media. Um, so if you have questions, either, you know, clinically oriented questions or questions about the, the name change, who we are, what we are, and what that means for the journal, which Linda and I represent, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to hear about you. We're getting to the end of our chat tonight, but I just wanted to thank uh, Linda Brubaker, who was our guest one more time for doing this wonderful inaugural Instagram. We're probably going to make this a bit of a habit, folks. We're going to uh, probably once every month or two have one of these lives with a guest um, so that we can chat about sort of controversial or interesting or happening things in the field. And you guys can learn what's going on in the field of urogynecology, uh, female Pelvic medicine will no longer be in the dark or in the closet. It's going to come out and, and become part of our lives. So thank you guys all for joining us and, and beaming in for a, a certain amount of time. We appreciate your, your time this evening. Kate, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I hope everybody is as excited as we are about our new journal, Urogynecology, the new format, the new look, the new feel, and try out some of the electronic features of downloading tables and figures easily for your slide presentations. We think you're going to love it. So we're looking forward to seeing how it goes for you. Yep. Thanks, everyone. And I hope you have a fantastic night. And round of applause for Stephanie for hosting. Absolutely. Us thank you, Stephanie. I just want to thank uh, both of you so much for taking the time out of your day to hold the first Instagram live event and for test filing this. Um, thank you to everybody for joining this as well on behalf of Oz and the Urogynecology Journal. And I hope everybody has a great day. <laughs> It'll be a video on the feed so you can watch it later on Instagram if you'd like.